Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hey, this is LK backstage at Hipstock 2010. I'm here with Ben Mazel. Right. And he was just speaking on the main stage, and your topic was? Well, I talked about an experiment we just launched, which was an online Twitter petition to the president to release all of our long-term marijuana prisoners held in the federal system. Something unlike all of his, oh, I can't do that because it takes 60 votes in the Senate and we don't have the votes. You know, legalization, not something the president can do by himself. But pardoning and commuting sentences and express presidential power in the Constitution. He's been longer without issuing a single pardon or commutation than any president ever. Right? We're actually at the longest period that nobody's been released because their sentence was excessively unjust or that they should never have been in. And uh, it's time for this president to step up. Uh, Gerald Ford actually released more marijuana prisoners than any other president ever. <laughs> That's an amazing statement. So the petition uh, to participate, you go to act.ly slash 2dk and uh, you will get a screen that says, well, I, we petition President Obama, has a, a back page that gives some more detail. And that shows up not just in his Twitter feed, which, you know, obviously it's some staffer that's monitoring, but everybody who watches the Barack or Obama Twitter feeds will see it. And uh, hopefully that junior staffer in the tech department passes it up to a mid-level staffer in the political department. And if we get really lucky, that's one who's sympathetic and passes it uphill. Cool. Uh, you probably have something interesting to say to this question, but I ask everybody that I interview if you could say one thing to the marijuana community, what would it be? Get active. <laughs> Short, but but to the point. I'd like to add, guys. Uh, let's write the president. Let's let's follow the, the the lead of this man and make sure that all of our warriors come home because it's an unjust war. We all know that. And again, this is LK backstage at Hipstock 2010. Its name is THC, and it was discovered back in 1964 in a lab in Jerusalem by chemist Raphael Mashulam. Cannabis had not been well investigated, which was strange. After all, it was being used illegally or illegally by millions of people, and yet we didn't know that much about it. So I thought it's a good idea to uh, look at it again from a modern point of view. In the lab, Mashulam and his colleagues broke cannabis down and zeroed in on the chemical components that might be causing its effects. We isolated about 10 compounds. Surprisingly, out of the 10 compounds we isolated, only one, which now is known as delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, in short THC, only one causes the well-known uh, high. We tested it in humans, many of my friends, and we saw that the compound is effective as we expected it to be. The identification of THC answered one question, but raised another. Just what did it do to the brain? I had always assumed that people knew how marijuana worked. It surprised me, actually, when I began looking in the research literature that, that it was really clear that no one really knew how it worked. In 1988, Alin Howlett found the answer. She discovered that deep inside the brain, THC molecules activate a previously unknown network of specialized chemical receptors. So that was proof that there is a receptor protein in the brain that can bind to the uh, THC like a key in a lock. It was very exciting because what that meant to us was we had a tool that could be used for studying and other researchers could use it as well. And people could study where the receptor was in the brain. Howlett and other scientists found the receptors in the hippocampus, which forms memories, 
the cerebellum, which controls movement, and the frontal cortex, where we think. Here were these receptors that this chemical produced by a plant out in the world just so happened to have the precise combination to unlock. What an extraordinary thing that is. Um, is that why that receptor network existed, so that people could get high? We don't have those receptors just so that people can get high smoking pot. Receptors are developed in neurons so that they can communicate with a chemical that the body makes. So that was the logic behind going in and trying to extract a compound in the brain that would act just like marijuana did. And in 1992, proof came that the brain does make a compound very much like THC. It was discovered by none other than Raphael Meshulam, who named it anandamide. We call it the brain's own marijuana because the compound that is made by the brain, anandamide, shares all the properties in terms of at the receptor level and cellular level that uh, THC has. It turns out that when anandamide is released in the brain, like marijuana, it affects such basic things as appetite, pain, and memory. And it plays a critical role in a sometimes underappreciated mental function, forgetting. When I first heard that, it didn't seem adaptive to me to have a drug for forgetting. Memory, we understand, has great survival utility. You, 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 know, you learn that that's a poisonous mushroom or that's a dangerous animal and you stay away and you remember that. But why would forgetting be adaptive? And I asked Michelin this question and he said, well, tell me, do you really want to remember all the faces you saw on the subway this morning? Forgetting well is almost as important as remembering well. Forgetting is about editing. It's about taking the flood, the ocean of sense information coming at you and forgetting everything but what's important. So life is not just about accumulating new memories. Memory can cripple us too. Get out! Get out! You have soldiers returning from war zones that are traumatized by experiences that, in effect, they can't unlearn. So if you could help them unlearn that, essentially a productive kind of forgetting, either with a drug or uh, some other kind of regime, that would be incredibly useful. Well, here's a little song that you might get along with all about a natural seed. Growing wild by the side of the roadway, it's nature's a wonderful weed. Been around so long, it's hard to tell why anyone would think it's new. Love it or hate it, however you relate it, I'll leave that up to you. But isn't that righteous? And isn't that good enough? Ain't that the way it ought to be? Isn't that righteous? And isn't that good enough? Righteous is good enough. History's locked in a cardboard box and it's hard to take a look With sidetrack frills and fantasies all written all over the book Everybody tells you what to think and they've got their reasons why You gotta pick reality up by the scruff of the neck and look it right in the eye And isn't that righteous? Isn't that good enough? Ain't that the way it ought to be? Isn't that righteous? And isn't that good enough? Righteous is good enough for me. Now the same people that are spreading the fear, the same people that scare me the most. You know, some of them look like they just as soon like they're hanging from a lamp post. They talk about what it does to your brain. Well, I just have to react. Cause Hitler never touched the stuff, and that's an actual fact. And isn't that righteous? Isn't that good enough? Ain't that the way it ought to be? Righteous is good enough for me. George Washington was the father of our country, and he had a hemp plantation. Betsy Ross used it to make the flag that flew above the baby nation. They wrote their declarations on paper from that same hemp fiber press, and I don't know what they spoke when they were taking a break, but I got a pretty good guess. And isn't that righteous? Isn't that good enough? Ain't that the way it ought to be? 
Isn't that righteous? Isn't that good enough? Righteous is good enough for me. us this day our daily yeses yes to life yes to living yes to caring yes to giving yes to creating yes to thinking yes to clarity yes to balance Yes, to see. Yes, to be. Yes, to yes. Give us this day our daily yes. chaos, desperations, despair, despairs, desperation, programmed belief, belief program, manipulated minds, minds manipulated, behaviors, reactions, reactions, behaviors, 
fearful thinking, thinking fearful, altered thought, thought altered, diseasing perceptions, perceptions diseasing, forgetting medicine, medicine forgetting, clear thinking, thinking clear, coherent, coherence, Coherency, coherent. Prayers given, given prayers. Peace and love, love and peace. Created realities, realities created. Whatever sees, sees whatever we do. Do we give us this day our daily yes? to see, yes to be, yes to balance, yes to coherence, yes to thinking, yes to creating, yes to giving, yes to caring, yes to living, yes to life. Give us this day our daily yes.
When you bring in the economic needs uh, of an economic crisis, I mean, consider alcohol would have not have been, uh, the prohibition against alcohol would not have been stopped had there not been the Great Depression because they realized it was a stupid waste of money. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate from my point of view because I'm just really into the civil liberties aspect of it that it would be an economic crisis that legalizes marijuana, but I guess I'll take it any way we can, all right? Now, what I want to talk about today is just, uh, let's just look at my, my notes here. It's not very, uh, uh, it's, it's not very uh, cohesive or, or uh, sort of like a pep rally thing. I've got a very cohesive little pep rally talk I'll give on the main stage later today. But people who are sitting here out of 100,000 people are, interested, are, are kind of interested in how do we bring this to the public. And I just want to share with you my experience lately. I, I've got uh, a lot of different angles on this that are kind of unique. First of all, I've spent a third of my adult life hanging out with Europeans who think, uh, a joint's about as exciting as a can of beer. It's just not a big deal over there. They look at us and they just kind of think, whoa, didn't you guys get over a reefer madness like, like in, in before the war? But no, it's still alive and well in our society. I've also had uh, 10 years now being outspoken as a you know, respectable part of the business community, as a church leader, as, a, as somebody that, that, that has uh, some sort of a celebrity that you got to take care of. And uh, against all conventional wisdom, I've been honest about my beliefs in this. I've come out. You know, I mean, remember when gay people were coming out a couple of decades ago and how courageous that was? Well, there's, I mean, there's, a, there's 50 people that love pot for anyone that's here being honest about it. That in itself is, is kind of pathetic in our society. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I'll be honest with you. When I first came to Hempfest, the people here scared me. You know, it's a freaky world. I mean, look at these guys. And then I saw it differently. I mean, Vivian helped me. Vivian explained, this is the one time of year when we can take this part. I'm recording. You know, and that's a beautiful thing. And uh, it gave me great respect for freedom. The irony is, we're more into freedom and the Constitution and what America's all about than all these people that think we're problems. And we've got to go over there and not scare them. That's our challenge. Well, we don't... That's, that's so clear to me. That's why I decided to wear my dorky jacket today, you know? I want to put a non-scary face on this drug policy issue. And this panel that was just up here was saying some very wise ideas about how do we frame this issue when we don't preach to the choir, but when we preach to people out there who need to hear this. I've also had some interesting time lately just getting to know police and people in law enforcement and respecting their opinion on this, and I want to uh, share that too. So I'm going to just kind of weave some ideas together for the next half hour here about that. Um, first of all, uh, um, Mr. Kerlikowski had one of his guys kind of tracking me and listening to all my talks and so on, and and because they were worried about what we what we were thinking, I and mean, apparently it was uh, threatening them. And then you got Norm Stamper actually talking some common sense and so on. What's going on? And I got to know this man, he's a wonderful man, very caring man, and he's diametrically opposed to us. He just thinks marijuana is the root of all evil. evil. Why is he involved? He cares. Why am I involved? I care. We both care. Let's understand what makes each other tick. Um, and, uh, you know, he, after a little while, we had dinner, and he asked me, why are you into this? Why are you? You're a well-off white guy in the suburbs, you could smoke pot for the rest of your life and you could email all your friends, they come on over, we're smoking pot and you're never going to get in any trouble. And I thought about it, you know, I think, you're right, I, I, why am I in this? Because I am in it, just like you are. What, what is motivating me? It's not my own well-being, I'm just tired of lies in our society. And this is one of a million crusades you could speak out on, and this is one crusade that decent people are afraid to speak out on. People say it's courageous. All right. People say it's courageous to speak out about marijuana, and just the fact that it's courageous to speak out on marijuana, if you care about freedom, is reason to speak out on marijuana. I've never said smoke pot. I've said it's a civil liberty to smoke pot if you choose to smoke pot. I believe very strongly that it is the, the, the responsible adult, recreational, no apologies necessary, it just makes my music more fun. <laughs> use of marijuana is a civil liberty. And I had this long dinner with this police officer who was the leading narcotics kind of guy in Seattle. And he refuted everything I said except for one thing. He said, I can't argue with your civil liberties idea. It's perfectly common sense. Perfectly common sense. It's the civil liberties thing that really, I think, can resonate. 
as a matter of principle, if you care about freedom, it is a civil liberty to enjoy getting high. I would never say you should get high. As a matter of fact, I think it's really important to be honest about the downside of pot. I'm speaking out, I get these rich women's groups hiring me, hiring me to go to Deep South and talk about travel. And I talk about marijuana. <laughs> you know? I mean, they're not inclined to hire a guy to come and talk about drug policy, but I talk to him about Europe. And I bring that into it. And what I really like to do is have credibility by shooting off all the torpedoes. Am I saying you should smoke pot? No. Am I saying kids should smoke pot? No, of course not. Am I saying it's okay to drive while you're intoxicated? No, you should throw the book at them. Am I saying healthy? No, it's not healthy. It can be addictive, it can mess you up. But that doesn't mean it should be criminal. You can take the crime out of it and you can deal with it as Europeans deal with it in the form of pragmatic harm reduction. Now for eight years when Bush was president, as soon as you had any kind of a proposal that had the word harm reduction in it, it was not even read, it was just thrown away because harm reduction is code for legalization. Now we can talk about harm reduction. There's a pragmatism that turns me on about European drug policy. They've got the same kind of challenges that we do, you know, but they, they do it differently. They do it with the pragmatism. So our challenge is to get out there and not be scary. Find yourself in a circle where people go, wow, I never dreamed you would be talking about marijuana in this progressive way. And then get their attention span and talk to them. I've done it on TV. I've done it on radio. I've done it in churches. I've done it in conservative groups. I've done it with rotary clubs. And afterwards, people are thankful for you bringing a little bit of logic and common sense. They don't need to agree with you, but all of a sudden they understand this is not just a bunch of heads wanting everybody to turn in and tune out and drop out or something like that, because that's what they're thinking. There's a thoughtful reason to be waging the crusade that we're waging. So, I said I'm, uh, I've spent a lot of time in Europe, and uh, it's fun to be in Europe, and one cool thing about being in Europe is you see your country from a distance. And you, when you step away from your country, you see the quirky things about your society, good and bad, in high contrast. And you, all of a sudden you realize more who you are and where you live. Um, I talked to this, this, uh, this man who spent 30 years of his life working in New York, like a lot of Greeks do. And he's retired, goes back to his home country. He gets back home and it occurs to him he never took a nap for the whole time he's in the United States. It just wasn't okay. And then he goes back to Greece and it's okay to relax, take a nap. I spent so many years taking my tour groups to Germany and trying to get them to just take off their clothes and relax in the spa. And Americans just can't do it. Anybody else can. We are so uptight about so many silly things. My TV show actually airs only after 10 o'clock in some markets in this country because we have 500-year-old marble penises and 300-year-old canvas breasts that we're showing the children. This is America. You go to, I was just in Frankfurt, and they have a place called Cafe Fix, right in the main street. And it's where all the junkies go to get their, mar their heroin uh, maintenance clinic uh, advice and counseling and, uh, and, and, uh, and deal with their habit. That's a very progressive, in-your-face, ugly kind of thing. They prescribe cocaine in Britain. Well, I, they, they have a progressive approach to hard drug problems in Europe that would put to shame our our uh, policies and uh, this is one thing that I like to try to introduce to Americans as a travel writer. As a travel writer I feel like my job is kind of like the medieval jester. You know in the Middle Ages the jester he would go out there and go around with the people in the, in the gutters. He'd come back into the castle and he could tell the king the truth and the king wouldn't tell him because the king needed to know the truth. The, the king actually paid the jester's room and board to be annoyed by the jester for him to come in and tell him the rude jokes everybody was talking about the king out there outside of the castle. Well, we need to be jesters. We need to go out there and find out what the rest of the world's doing and come home. And that's a beautiful thing about travel, and that's one thing I try to do in my travel writing. There's a lot of fear in our society right now. Have you noticed it? Fear is being used against us. There's fear about marijuana. There's fear about uh, uh, terrorism. There's fear about everything. I mean, I was just... Uh, one thing I like to do in my travels is go places where you're supposed to be afraid and just see if there's anything to that fear. I was just in Iran. I was afraid to go to Iran. I almost left my big camera in Athens because I thought they'd be throwing stones at us as soon as they saw an American film from the streets of Tehran. I got there and all of a sudden I realized I've never enjoyed such a warm welcome on the streets of any city in the world as when I was in Iran. I was in a traffic jam, stuck in a traffic jam with my driver. It's a big city, 10 million people I think in Tehran. We're going nowhere. Suddenly my driver just bursts out, death to traffic. 
And I thought, wait a minute, I thought it was death to Israel or death to America. He says, no, right now it's death to traffic. Um, you know, and he said, I said, well, what's with that? He said, here in our country, whenever we're frustrated by something that's just out of our control, we say death to that. So all of a sudden, that little experience for me let me have a more sophisticated and nuanced understanding of what death to the United States means in a rally outside of our embassy. Now that's how travel can overcome some fear. There's also that about all sorts of alternative lifestyles. And when you travel, you have that joy. And as a travel writer, as I mentioned, I like to, to bring that home, and I can give you lots of different examples of that. When I think about my interest in marijuana, it goes back also to how casual marijuana is in many cultures. I mean, of course, you go around much of Europe, and, and marijuana is just, it's not a big deal. I'm always talking about it like it's a big deal, because in our country, you can do hard, hard time for it. And the Europeans think that gets get over it. I mean, most Dutch people have never smelled marijuana. They don't care about marijuana. It's just something that's, that some young people do as a stage, and a few people that they're artistic kind of, you know, crazies, and they enjoy marijuana all their life. And that's just fine. It's not an issue. The very interesting thing when you travel and you're interested in drug policy when you go to Europe is you find there's a fundamental difference in Europe. Time and time again, my European friends tell me a society has to make a choice, tolerate alternative lifestyles or build more prisons. They always, they always are interested in tolerance. They're proud of how few people they incarcerate. In the United States, we incarcerate eight times as many people per capita as Europeans do. Eight times as many people. When you go to Europe, you find that they have drug problems. They lost 8,000 people to heroin overdoses last year. We lost 18,000. It's a serious problem in both societies. How do they do it? They've got 400 million people, we've got 300 million people. They've got progressive laws where they've got their cafe fix on the main street to give people their heroin and, and their counseling and so on. We've got locking people up. How do they manage to lose less than half the people that we do and they've got more people and easier laws? Pragmatism, harm reduction. I was in Zurich a little while ago, going to a coffee, uh, just have a coffee. I went downstairs to the bathroom, the lights are blue. What's going on with that? Open the door, complete blue lights. Then I realized, oh, I can't see my veins. Couldn't shoot up if I wanted to. Very frustrating. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought, well, that's interesting. So they don't, they've got a public toilet, basically, and they would have all their uh, junkies down there shooting up if they didn't have blue lights. Now the junkies can't find their veins, so they won't shoot up in their toilet. Across the street, I noticed a machine that used to sell cigarettes. And it's been repainted and retooled, and now it sells government subsidized syringes. I bought them, they're like one franc each, and they're just, you know, generic syringes. Nobody shares needles in Switzerland. There's no discussion about it. There's no moralistic sort of political party in Switzerland that says you shouldn't be providing people needles. It's just common sense. So you got your blue lights, you got your uh, heroin, uh, you got your needles dispensed from old cigarette machines, and then down the street, you got your cafe fix, your heroin maintenance clinic. And then what happens there is, people go there for their fix, they go there for medical counseling, they don't have this nervousness where they have to top up and uh, consequently they consume less of that drug and they get themselves back on track. They've got a wonderful track record in Switzerland for being more progressive when it comes to that problem. Europe has found that when you take crime out of the equation and you treat drug abuse as a health problem and an education challenge, you have much more positive results. They find that if you, I just learned this from the website at the European Union, they figure for every euro they put into education and counseling, they save 15 euros on police and health costs. So they're, they're very wellness approach to this. And one thing they've learned, as I mentioned, is you cannot legislate morality. Nobody's gonna say smoking pot is good. Nobody's gonna say prostitution is good. But you can say it is futile to make it illegal. It's gonna happen, it makes more sense to legislate it, make it safe, and give people some opportunity to learn about the problem and get over it. When you look at the European Union website, there's no talk of marijuana as an evil thing. There is, when you search for cannabis, the only cannabis reference you find is, quote, problem cannabis use. Problem cannabis use. Some people use it too much, they get reliant on it, and that needs to be dealt with. In Germany, they think that uh, it's, um, boys smoke more pot than girls in their teenage years, and they think it's because socially boys are more nervous with girls and they smoke a little uh, marijuana in order to be more comfortable socially. So they give them, they actually have counseling centers where they give them flirting lessons so they can, so they can flirt a little more confidently without the help of the marijuana. I don't know if that's gonna work or not, but the point is they're thinking out of the box, they're being pragmatic, they're being creative, not making it a crime, but making it an education challenge. 
Here's an example of pragmatism in Europe. When you travel in Scandinavia in June, you find drunk teenagers in flatbed trucks just making all sorts of noise going through all the towns. What's going on? It's graduation party time. All the kids are getting drunk. Who's paying for the parties? The parents are. Parents hire the trucks, hire the drivers, and host the keggers. Parents don't want their kids to get drunk on graduation, but parents in Scandinavia are pragmatic enough to know that kids will get drunk on high school graduation, no matter what you say, and they would rather make sure they don't drink and drive. Now, that would be a real tough sell in America. We would rather have the moralistic stance, don't drink, and then kids will drink, and they will drive and drink, and they will die, as they do every year in our society. That's the American approach to a form of drug abuse, teenagers getting really drunk on graduation time, and the European approach is more honest, it's more credible, and bottom line, harm reduction. Fewer people die. The um, blue lights thing I was talking about, that's another good example of that. And of course, marijuana is considered a soft drug rather than a hard drug. It's hard when you talk about drug policy in Europe to make a sweeping statement because every country has its own um, policies and we always zero in on the Netherlands and that's not fair because there are some countries that have very regressive marijuana policies but more and more countries in Europe are making marijuana quasi legal you won't find it legal anywhere it's not absolutely legal anywhere except I think in Portugal uh, where consumption is legal but sale is not and in my experience that's because these countries are afraid to enter into a trade war with the United States the United States has huge power on Canada and on Europe not to legalize marijuana. And my friends in Denmark tell me we got to be a little bit careful with marijuana because every year we have to arrest a couple of pot smokers in order to maintain favorite trade status with the United States of America. That's our country. That's our country. Because of my research chores, I have to go to a lot of coffee shops in Amsterdam. <laughs> And uh, I just love to find these coffee shops in Amsterdam. And look at them from a business, and it's 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 just an amazing thing. Um, they've got the loner bombs if you don't have your own. They've got your email. You can check your email while you're there. There's no no minors. They won't sell to people under 18. Uh, older clients don't like the edgy vibe in a coffee shop, so they just park their bicycle and get a little marijuana to go, and they'll go back to their place and enjoy it. Uh, the police like the existence of coffee shops in Amsterdam because they have a bulletin board where they can post information about what dangerous chemical drugs are being sold on the streets. The police really see the coffee shops in Amsterdam as a firewall between soft drug use and hard drug abuse, and it's very effective. Now, we're so honed in on that gateway drug nonsense that we can't hardly imagine that. But Europeans know that the only reason marijuana could ever be a gateway drug is because of its illegality. It's the only thing gateway about marijuana. It's nonsense to say he smoked marijuana and now he's a serial rapist. Well, that doesn't mean it's a gateway drug or something any more than he smoked marijuana and now he's hooked on heroin. But what is the gateway aspect of marijuana is that if it is illegal, People can only get it from criminals selling it on the streets, and those criminals have a vested interest in getting into something more expensive, more addictive, and more profitable than marijuana, and that's anything hard. In the Netherlands, they don't have that. As a matter of fact, it's been 25 years in the Netherlands since they arrested anybody for marijuana, and during that time, the hard drug using population is getting older and not getting bigger. It's aging and, and sort of withering away, whereas the soft drug enjoying population is about the same maybe 10% more because of its quasi-legality. But uh, a very interesting aspect of the whole discussion to me is in America there's a lot of fear about legalizing marijuana because a lot of frightened people out in the suburbs think as soon as that's legal, it's just going to be one hemp-fest hell. All of our world is going to be overwhelmed by people with weird t-shirts and funny hair. And uh, my feeling is that there's not a reservoir of people out there wishing they could ruin their lives if only it was legal. You know, in our society, anybody who wants to smoke pot is smoking pot. Anybody who wants to be a freak is a freak. It's just a free world and you can live your life the way you want to live it. Europe's, ex Europe's experience, they've got a 25 year track record on this, between 10 and 25 years depending on the country, is use does not go up when you get more easy going on your laws. As a matter of fact, by every count, and it's frustrating to use statistics in Europe because everybody, or in this discussion, because everybody's got an agenda who makes statistics. You look at a conservative statistics like our police do, and you're going to see all sorts of stuff you want to see. You look at liberal statistics like anybody in our camp does, and you're going to see the statistics you want. But across the board, the statistics in the United States and in Europe show that Americans consume double per capita the marijuana that Europeans do. 
and the Dutch consume no more than the average in Europe. The conclusion you can draw from that quite, quite um, clearly is that how hard the laws are do not impact how many people enjoy marijuana recreationally. And that's a fundamental, it's a little bit beyond the attention span of the average just say no bumper sticker person who's af afraid of marijuana. But you gotta sit people down and talk to them a little bit and actually they find this quite interesting. When you think about the situation in the Netherlands, the, you know, the King County Bar Association is a national leader in our country for uh, thinking about the reality of marijuana and, uh, and the pragmatism of not criminalizing it. And they've also been thinking about what happens after it's legal. I went to a two or three day seminar, Roger Goodman and a bunch of guys in Seattle put on and people from all over the country came there, talking about, okay, let's have the hypothetical situation that marijuana is legal, now how do we regulate it? That's a very tough thing. The Europeans have been struggling with this and they haven't figured it out. In the Netherlands, you've got that gray area you can sell it all you want, but just we don't want to know how it's wholesaled. And they, they don't want big wholesalers. They like little boutique producers. My friends who run coffee shops in Amsterdam have told me they don't import marijuana much anymore like they used to. They used to get fancy strains from all over Asia and Africa and so on. Now they've got the technology to grow it locally. It's safer and easier for them to grow it locally, and they get those strains that they wanted. They've got, you know, they've got the cannabis cup and that sort of thing. Well, that's, what's with that? Well, every different uh, boutique grower, like microbrews or something, is going to have their own forte, and they have a contest and see what it is. Almost all that is locally grown. Uh, in the Netherlands, they have got to figure out how to regulate the marijuana because it is essentially legal. For instance, uh, and this is something that will allay a lot of fears in the United States, a lot of people who are afraid of marijuana legalization don't want billboards advertising it. I don't think anybody would want marijuana legalized and advertised any more than we'd want hard liquor advertised everywhere you look. You know how we control that. Very easy to control that. As a matter of fact, in the Netherlands, you step into a coffee shop, and I do this as my, uh, in my research, to think, okay, I'm a little bit clueless and overwhelmed as a typical person to be. How, how, how do I know what to buy? I step into a coffee shop, I don't see a menu. Where's the menu? And he says, you've got to push that button. So I push the button, and by physically pushing the button, it lights the menu and I can read it. But the point is, I have to take the initiative to get the information. It cannot come to me. You see what I mean? That's just a little legalistic fine point, but that's a fascinating way that they've dealt with that in the Netherlands. That's pragmatism. That's really thinking, how can I accomplish something? They're not gonna advertise it to the outside world. They're not gonna have a coffee shop next to a school. They're not gonna let minors have it. They're gonna limit it to a, a small amount, all this kind of thing. It's fascinating to see how they do that. Right now, the mayor of Amsterdam is proposing doubling the legal inventory for coffee shops in Amsterdam. Right now, a coffee shop can still sell literally a ton of pot over a course of a year, as long as he never has more than half a kilo in stock. That's one pound. And the problem with that is, of course, you have all these little, you know, we're out. It's 2 o'clock, we're out. Bring some more. It's, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, we've got a, another uh, delivery. And the, the mayor just doesn't like the traffic congestion caused by all the petty <laughs> deliveries. <laughs> so the mayor of Amsterdam right now, it's a big discussion, is promoting doubling the allowable inventory limit to 1 kilo, 2.2 pounds. And that would cut in half the traffic congestion caused by little pot deliveries. So uh, that's an interesting issue. Another interesting issue is, of course, Europe has gone smoke-free, tobacco-wise. You can't smoke tobacco indoors in most countries in Europe. You go to the great pubs of Europe, they used to be so smoky, and you had to put up with it. Now, they're completely smoke-free. It's quite nice, and everybody is sitting outside with blankets around them smoking, smoking their cigarettes, because you can only smoke outside. If you're a coffee shop in Amsterdam or anywhere in the Netherlands, and you don't have a place to sit outside, your business is at a huge disadvantage because it's illegal to smoke mar uh, tobacco indoors. And Europeans like to mix their marijuana with tobacco. So uh, if you have a place outside to sit, it fits your clientele. If you don't, you're in trouble. Curiously, if you're a coffee shop in Amsterdam, you can lose your license if you let people smoke tobacco. But they can smoke all the marijuana they want. I had this nice dinner with a local policeman, and I learned a lot, and we need to respect and I'm glad we do respect the law enforcement in our city, especially during hemp fest and this sort of thing. I mean, one thing about policemen is they're not, they didn't make these laws. They're hired to enforce the laws. They're, they don't even think about the logic of a law. They're trained not to think about the logic of the law, but think about enforcing the laws. And you've got to be thankful there are police enforcing laws. What we need to do is not be pissed off at the police, but change the law if it's a stupid one. That is good citizenship, to advocate changing the law. It's not a good thing. Good citizenship if 
we recognize the law that's causing more harm than the problem it's trying to address, to talk to people, educate people, and change it. And that's what we're doing here in a beautiful, not very fast process, but in a beautiful process. Um, I think that uh, what I learned from, uh, from my discussion with this uh, police officer is the driving mission for police, along with uh, enforcing the laws, is protecting children and stopping violence, all right? One beautiful thing about us here at Hempfest is it's a mellow crowd. It blows them away how mellow we are, and nobody is trying to get kids high. I, as, as these guys said in the panel before, let's make that very, very clear. Every time we talk about legalizing marijuana, is, it's not for kids. You can debate 18 or 21. I think there's a lot of wisdom in 18, just because you don't want to force people to do illegal things. You want to be pragmatic about it. But allay that concern from the start, right off the bat. Because the two, the two things I always hear is, you want all the kids to get high, and you want people driving when they're high. Think no, of the children. No. You should treat it as serious as Europe does. You know, Europe is much more strict on driving while intoxicated than we are. And they're much more liberal about getting intoxicated. So they're able to give people the civil liberty, but maintain order, and that's something we can do also. Again, cops don't care to evaluate the law. They're hired to enforce the law. Most policemen just think if there's trouble, it's because those people have been messing around with drugs. Alcohol, hard drugs, marijuana, and they put it all in the same ball, all right? So marijuana has the problem of being in there with the alcohol and the hard drugs in the mind of a police officer. I'm not, I'm not saying I understand this or agree with this, it's just that's the reality from their perspective, and I, I think it makes a little sense. Um, they're a little offended by the, mar mar the medical marijuana thing because they think a lot of people just say they got chronic neck pains and uh, they go get their card and they just are, are making a, a sham of the whole thing. Um, I think, um, as I mentioned, we use the word harm reduction right away. They think you're just, that's just a front for legalization. And, uh, and the reality is, they told me that the reality is, uh, you know, if you're, if you're just using it uh, uh, responsibly and, and low key, it's, it's pretty safe. My feeling is, of course, it's a racist law and it's a classist law. If you're a rich white guy, you're pretty safe. If you're not wealthy, if you're not well educated, if you're on the streets, and if you're a person of color, you got a real serious problem. And that in itself is reason to take a hard look at this law. I do want to talk just for a minute about the parallels between prohibition in the 1920s and 30s and prohibition today against marijuana, because there's all, we can learn a lot from that. And uh, uh, remember there was a, a lot of discussion back in the 30s, and when they finally made alcohol legal, nobody was saying booze is good. There was just a broad recognition that the law is more costly than the drug problem itself. And that's what we're doing today. We're saying that the law is more costly than the drug problem itself. I think um, uh, when we look at what's happening today, historically, we're going to see there's this perfect storm that comes together just like that which happened back in the 1930s. And 70 years later, nobody would argue that uh, alcohol should be uh, illegal again. Um, I think we need to worry about our credibility. And I think I've talked about credibility enough, but it's that kids thing and that driving thing that comes back and back again. My experience, a lot of people are curious, well, how can I talk about this uh, in public? And I get introduced all over the place as that marijuana guy, or uh, the board member of Normal, or you know, with the ACLU. And a lot of people cringe. My staff cringes because my staff is worried about, you know, are we going to be in business next year? Um, I've got when I get underwriting for my TV show, I've got, you know, they're all wigged out about what are you going to say about marijuana? Uh, and uh, when I get a big to write for a big magazine, they'll say, well, I promise you won't tell everybody to go to Amsterdam and get high. Uh, you know, people are, people are, business people are really nervous about this. I think the business community is behind the politicians, and the politicians are behind the public. And it's just an evolutionary thing. Politicians are learning. You have Senator Cole Wells right here. All over the country, I've been talking to politicians. This is not so radical to them. I mean, they don't, they're realizing it's no longer political suicide to talk smartly about this issue. It's still, they've got a lot of fish to fry, and this is just, why do I want to get involved in this one, you know? But uh, I think that we've made a lot of progress in that way. But in my experience, it's the corporate world that's so nervous about it. And there's no ethics in the corporate world. I mean, uh, I mean, think about um, Mark. You know Mark Phelps, right? Well, when he got what was the deal? He uh, he was underwritten, or he was a spokesperson for uh, Kellogg's, wasn't it? And 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 Subway sandwiches, yeah. And so Kellogg's or whoever was got rid of him as a as a spokesperson because he's a, he smokes marijuana. And then Kellogg's stock like plummets, seventy percent. Subway sandwiches, what is going to get rid of them also? And they saw what happened to Kellogg's stock. 
and they had a meeting and they said, you know, this would be costly for us to get rid of Mark Phelps. In fact, maybe it's a plus to have Mark Phelps when it comes to Subway sandwiches. And, and, and Google this, check this out. Subway actually, after Kellogg's dumped Mark Phelps, Su Michael Phelps, Subway sandwiches started an ad campaign called Eat Subway Sandwiches and Feel the Buds. <laughs> It's serious. Check it out. So, but what I brought from that is corporations have no moral statements. They're just reading the bottom line. And if they can realize that it's not bad for their bottom line, they can care less if everybody's high or not, as long as they're spending their money in their court. Right? Um, every time I'm on the media talking about this, it's amazing to me how uptight people get. And when it's done, the, the, the mic's turned off. They say, thank you for speaking out. Across the board, I've been on every station around here, you know, and they're all nervous. They can't believe I'm talking about it. When it's off, they go, thank you, you're speaking about it. They can't. Everybody's worried about their jobs. It's a scary time economically, and with this prohibition and all the lies and, and all the cowardice in our public, it's scary for people. Uh, when uh, ACLU contacted me to do that half-hour video, I don't know if you've seen it, but check it out. And they did a great job. It's a wonderful, wonderful half-hour historical, informational documentary about the war against marijuana. I learned a lot in the process making this show. Have, been, have any of you seen the show that ACLU did on Marijuana Time for a discussion? It's on YouTube, yeah. Well, everybody who cares about this should have a little background on the whole situation. And check it out. Now, we have three TV stations in our state, in our city, three, three local stations. We were going to buy half an hour. We're going to pay them just what you pay for a Thighmasters ad, you know? And they wouldn't let us do it. They would let you advertise Thighmaster, but not talking about marijuana. There's so much fear in the media about this because they think you would offend and scare away your advertisers. So this is a challenge that we have to uh, deal with, and it's been a frustrating thing for me in my own world. I have to talk about this really up front with all of my TV stations, all of my radio stations, all of my newspaper syndications, all of my publishers, and let them know I am a spokesperson for the legalization of marijuana. I'm not in favor of smoking marijuana. I don't think it's for kids. I don't think you should drive while intoxicated. I think the law is causing more problems than the drug problem itself. And I think, bottom line, the adult, responsible, recreational use of marijuana is a civil liberty. You see how clear that was? If you can get them to listen that long, if you can get them to listen that long, and if they got half a brain, they see you're not evil, all right? But if you can't get them to listen, they just think you're going to be uh, taking all their kids into some sort of a, a hempish nightmare, all right? So, uh, uh, and once in a blue moon, in, in, my, in my travels, you know, some, my, my travel business, somebody calls me up and they say, I just read what you think about marijuana, and we're not going to go on your tour, we're canceling out, we're telling all our friends not to travel with Rick Steves Europe either. And all I can think is, Europe will be much more fun without you. <laughs> times in this country and you know, are really tough and um, I'm surprised there's not more people who are business leaders who can't have a little fun with honesty you know what I mean I know so many business leaders who agree with us but because of their financial nervousness they cannot talk about it. there are community leaders thought leaders respected people that understand we're not pro drugs we're pro freedom and civil liberties and pragmatism when it comes to dealing with drug abuse problems I've made a point to talk with every one of our Congress people, our senators, our mayor, our governor, my pastor. They know what I think. They respect me for it. I've got my little lines down. You know, I know how to shoot off the torpedoes. I want them to know what I think. We all need to do that. If we did that more effectively, we would be a lot farther along and we'd be able to have a real celebration when we come to a gathering like this. Please, think of ways to do that. Okay, I'm going to just uh, wrap it up here. I think I've gone through all of my notes pretty well. I want to remind you, um, there's advocacy groups out there. I mean, I can't keep track of all the, the wonks. There's a lot of policy wonks that, I mean, just blow me away how they understand all these issues and the legislative initiatives and everything. But all of us who care about this issue, and all of us that don't want to be criminals, and all of us who have friends that can't even come here because they'll lose their jobs or they're worried about what their friends will think they want to come here. All of these people need to recognize 
that there are advocacy groups waging a hard and serious battle for us as experts. They're putting up lucrative careers to be working in this civil liberty struggle. And you can, it's a fun thing as a citizen to shop around and choose which one turns you on. Everybody's got a different take on it. I love the work of Normal. I've been a board member of Normal for nearly 10 years now. And I don't look at these groups like Normal as charities. They are services. And they're fighting a battle for me. And if you're not a paying member of some advocacy group, you're frankly not on board. It's 20 bucks. It's 20 bucks. You can put on a funny t-shirt and come down here once a year and we're never gonna get anywhere. Join an advocacy group, make a political statement, tell your friends, make it not scary, and bring it out to the suburbs. This is good citizenship. Thank you very much. Thank you.